the Buddhist view on happiness that's, you know, is really the, the reality view on happiness is, um, yeah, it's more, the, the better word might be satisfaction, contentment, well-being, mm. like, yeah. it's not the temporary things of like having an ice cream cone or a nice walk or a, a, someone kiss you or something like that, which, which are all lovely, that's pleasure and it doesn't last. But happiness really can be long-lasting. Hey everyone, it's Raghu, and I'm back with Mind Rolling, and uh, we have a new guest, Scott Snibby. And Scott, welcome to the show. As Thank you say. so much for having me. Really pleased to be here. Scott has a, a wonderful book, How to Train a Happy Mind, and um, a skeptic's guide to enlightenment, path to enlightenment. Um, first of all, how did you even get near? The, I, I mean, my own thing about happy, I mean, I loved it when I saw How to Train a Happy yeah. Mind. That's good. Um, because that's what was absolutely missing when I was a teenager and then later years, late teens. Uh, by that time, I was looking for, you know, something else. Mm -hmm. Thank God, and I say this a billion times, thanks, thanks to God for Bob Dylan. At least I knew I wasn't the only one out there that was completely depressed about, you know, what is this society? What is this school? What is this... Um, you know, parental guidance uh, or restrictive nature, whatever. And um, so then, actually, my first thing was this, it's very similar to Ramdas. Uh, we both, there was a, a saint in India called Mayor Baba from back in the day. He used to, what he did, he was great. He used, his guru was, uh, Shirdi Sai Baba, one of the great free beings of, of the yeah. last 150 years, very much like Neem Karoli Baba. And uh, I saw a picture, and he was smiling, and he, yeah. it was like, be happy. <laughs> yeah, that's what I want. I want to be happy. And uh, as uh, nature would have it, fortunately, I was presented with enough different ways and obviously with a being like Neem Karoli Baba to, to recognize what the possibilities were in a human. So, yeah, how did you evolve from there? I'm, I'm not sure if you were as unhappy as I was, but, uh, you know, I don't know. Yeah, oh, well, that's a long, that's a big question. Um, happiness. I mean, I have to... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, I uh, I used to wake up. I mean, the thing is, that's what Buddhism really says: is actually, if you're in tune with reality, then you're happy. Even even the darkest, deepest thing, parts of reality, if you're absolutely in tune with the way things truly are, that's the Buddhist view of of how happiness comes. Which is just, you know, we can unpack that. It's a little confusing if you've never heard that before. But I remember as a kid. You know, I went through difficult things, definitely. Um, but somehow I felt this ground of... Every morning when I woke up when I was a kid, I used to feel this extraordinary feeling of infinity, like almost a scary, like overwhelming feeling, <laughs> like, oh, I've always existed, I'll always exist, and you know, like the universe is beautiful. And now I understand you'd connect those to things like um, the fundamental, what we call the fundamental goodness, in, in the book, I call it the, the the chapter before I begin the sequence. I talk about the mind, and one of the most extraordinary things about at least Mahayana Buddhism is that it says each of, each of our minds are fundamentally good. Mm. And so, um, mm. I think you know that was kind of my path to happiness. I went through all kinds of travails. I was um, I was raised. I come from a Jewish family that converted to Christian Science. Oh, I, really? I, I have that know. in my family, too. That's oh, really? Wild. Gosh, yeah. yeah I don't, grandmother. We don't, we don't have to go on a crazy detour there. But um, <laughs> in my 20s, I was kind of irreligious, and it was very difficult. I really felt like I needed... I'm a person that just loves spiritual... I always love the invisible things in the world, like what is what is death? <laughs> you know, what is life? What is the mind? Mm. And what happens after you die and so on? So, um, and the concept of infinity. So, I got into Buddhism through my brother, he became a Buddhist, and then four years later, I saw that it didn't dissolve his personality, you know, it only brought out <laughs> his best qualities. Yeah. 
that was my fear. And so I became, I, I was kind of like your tip. I think a lot of people in their twenties were like I was like, you actually get a lot of what, what they tell you is going to satisfy you in life in terms of some material comfort, a nice place to live, mm -hmm. even, even a nice partner. And still I was like anxious. I, inside I felt judgmental when I, very often when I met people, I would just be thinking judgmental things about them and, and um, feeling anxious for no reason, just anxiety. And so luckily I found Buddhism and I started to understand like the causes of those kind of problems, which turns out to be, to put it in simple terms, self-centeredness. You know, yeah. or or selfness. <laughs> you know, yes, selfness yes, is yeah. a is a higher way of saying it. Yeah. That that actually that lie we've been told by our society that as long as you get yours, you're going to be happy. Yeah. Anyone who's actually gotten some of theirs has realized it's actually not true, and that yeah. the true cause of happiness, the Dalai Lama says, is to benefit others. He says, by all means, be selfish, but be intelligently selfish. If you want to be happy, cherish others. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so that was the path I embarked on, you know, 25 years ago with Tibetan teachers and Western teachers in the Tibetan mm. lineage. Um, and eventually it ended up with this book, How to Train a Happy Mind. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Um, happy is a, an interesting word. And you've just described the little bit of the ins and outs of, of what, uh, how people relate to it. And uh, I have a good story. Mm. When I was in India with Neem Karoli Baba, yeah. my father decided he was going to come over yeah. because we had been writing letters. My brother was there with me yeah, yeah. saying, wow, this is incredible. We never met anybody like that, you know, that kind of thing. And so he came. And I didn't have a great relationship with my father, so yeah. I was kind of surprised that he did come. Anyhow, he came and, and met Neem Karoli Baba. And I remember yeah. one time, we called him Maharaji Neem Karoli Bama, said, so why did you come? And my father said, well, I came to see how my sons were doing. And, and he said, okay, well, how are they doing? And my father said, well, they seem to be happy. <laughs> and Maharaji said, happiness is everything. But this is through a translator, you know, and to this day, the intent that I got out of it was, we're talking not about what you just mentioned. We get our happiness from our jobs, from our relationships, mm. from the material in this world. But it was about contentment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's what you described afterwards. That happiness is being able to be with what is mm -hmm. in that way. That's, that's happiness. So, yeah. Yeah, and a lot of people, it's <laughs> funny, the number of people who raise their hand, you know, at a talk and say like, I don't want to be happy. <laughs> really? <laughs> you know, but it's, it's understandable because the word happy, I think what they're saying is I don't want to pretend I'm happy, right? I don't want to yeah, be right. fake. Uh, yeah. I'd rather be honestly miserable <laughs> than yeah. falsely happy. <laughs> yeah, right. But, but, you know, the, the Buddhist view on happiness, that's, you know, is really the, the reality view on happiness is um yeah it's more the, the better word might be satisfaction contentment well-being mm. like yeah. it's not the temporary things of like having an ice cream cone or a nice walk or a, a, someone kiss you or something like that which which are all lovely that that's pleasure and it doesn't last but happiness really can be long lasting um to last a whole life or or even more if mm. if you believe there's more yeah um yeah well i mean the sec the uh, the book describes uh, your um, movement from skepticism to the Buddhist translation of reality, shall we say? So yeah, what happened in your life around that in terms of being a skeptic and and so on? I was beyond a skeptic. I was just completely a zero, trying to like, okay, what is this about? I mean, I, you know. Yeah, beginner's mind. Yeah. Um, well, I was somebody who really was into science and mathematics, and uh. and in in a way that it, I felt like the wonder of what science and mathematics told us about reality was way beyond anything that I saw in the Bible or or any any kind of spiritual stories that I had been exposed to, you know, when I was younger. And so, um, I had read a lot about 
Buddhism. My brother kept sending me books as he was a Buddhist like four years before me. And I did not understand it, to be honest. It seemed quite complicated and language I didn't understand. Uh, but what happened was I went to see the Dalai Lama with my brother because I thought he'd enjoy it. This is where, this is where uh, you know, benefiting others, it just always pays off. If there's something you really do in life that's selfless, boy, does it seem to pay off, at least, you know, psychologically. And so I took him. I thought, well, he likes the Dalai Lama. I'll take him. I can sit through anything. We'll have fun. Here um, in America when His Holiness was In Los was Angeles. Here. In Los oh, yeah. Angeles in 2000. Yeah. And the mm. instant I saw His Holiness the Dalai Lama, I said, okay, I want what he's having. Because he <laughs> yeah. went through a Holocaust, a genocide. A million yeah. Tibetans died. Um, others in the same situation didn't ha st haven't had his reaction. You know, he was so nonviolent. He said, if we kill one Tibetan, we make one, if we kill one Chinese person, we make a hundred Chinese enemies. So we have to remain nonviolent. That is that is the long term cause of peace and autonomy, freedom. And he was so funny. He's still funny. He was still happy. Like you don't have to be miserable to have having gone through all, all kinds of awful things. You don't have to be miserable to be an effective activist and teacher and so on. So it really struck me. He's incredibly joyful, very realistic about reality, and very powerful and effective in affecting the world. And so I thought, I want what he's having. Just give it to me straight up. Um, so I went back to San Francisco. I found a Tibetan teacher. And you study Tibetan Buddhism, and our, my lineage is, is very heavy. You know, I study tens of thousands of hours, about a month of retreat every year. Mm. Um, but it does work. It works. It, it works. Um, some things, there's some effects you see immediately if you've never had any ex exposure to it. Then some things happen quite slowly. And some things haven't happened yet <laughs> to me. <laughs> But um, that was my experience is just, wow, it was my, my eyes got opened to basic truths of reality that were never taught to me in school and weren't taught by other religions like impermanence, how precious every day is, and then the value, what compassion and love, how you can have a compassion and love that expands to everybody and still have boundaries and still be safe. Um, and then the ultimate nature of reality, you know, interdependence, that this sense of being separate from other people and the world is a total misunderstanding Illusion. And, the, and the total cause of our suffering, thinking yeah. we're separate. You couldn't harm the environment if you didn't feel separate from it. Yeah. You couldn't harm another person if mm. you didn't feel separate from them. Yep. Yeah. And just continuing with His Holiness, who I feel the same way about and uh, spent a, a lot of time when he would come over and, and, you know, days yeah. on end, Kala chakras were incredible. I had no idea what the hell he's taught. Sometimes they just watch, look around you as people falling out and going to sleep. And he would joke about that as well. Um, but yeah, your own, did, yeah. did you, did you ever get over to India and meet him in Dharamsala? I have never been to India and Nepal. Never been although there was a oh. couple, but you know, the Bay Area, it's like within, 10 miles of my house are everything you need to get enlightened. <laughs> you know? Like there's so many teachers, there's multiple teachers in every lineage. So within 50 miles, like, oh my God, it's, it's, it's extraordinary. So in terms of practice, there's actually, if you live in the Bay Area, there's no need to ever go anywhere else. Um, and I did see His Holiness though many times. He had a very, as he, it sounds like you were part of, you know, a, a groupie. But yeah, when, when His Holiness, His Holiness was coming to the United States every year for a very long yeah. time. So from yeah. like 2000 until, I don't know what it was, 2012 or 13, um, you know, I would go to at least one of his teachings when he came to the U.S. Mm. Um, every time. So, you know, and now you can see him on Zoom all the time. So yeah. no, you know, I have an abundance, more teachings than I could ever uh, attend, you know, within a few miles uh, <laughs> of my house, luckily. Okay. Um, but you did study with, and I think he's your teacher, if I'm not mistaken, Lama Zopa Rinpoche. Yeah, correct? yeah, he's one of my teachers. Um, and, you know, he's the head of the FPMT, the Foundation for the Preservation of the Mahayana Tradition, which is quite a mouthful. He just passed uh, recently. Yeah, a year ago, a year yeah. ago, yeah. And that's the organization that I um, kind of fell into, uh, which has many, many, it has a combination of two things, very interesting. It has very deeply authentic Tibetan teachers. One like 
the highest level, where they're called geshes, which is like, yeah. equivalent, it's like they say it's like a PhD in Buddhism, but it takes 20 years to get. Um, and so my main Tibetan teacher is a geshe who lives in San Francisco, geshe dakpa, geshe nawang dakpa. And then I have, and that's like the authentic monastic education that hasn't really changed in, you know, almost a thousand years in a way. And then I also had uh, Western teachers who were students of Lama Yeshe. Lama Yeshe was the one who founded this organization, who was a very wild, very creative, very innovative, uh, wise Tibetan Buddhist who was one of the first to teach to Westerners. He's also saying over and over, this needs to be adapted to the West. Add, put this into scientific language, take out anything that feels superstitious. You know, this the path needs to be adapted to, you know, what you said Western minds used to say, but in a way it's modern minds now because it's, what, what, if you live in India or China, you know, you have the same mentality as everyone around in the world. Most people around the world now is a more materialistic yeah. view. So Lama Zopa was the heart disciple, like the main student of Lama Yeshe. When Lama Yeshe tragically died early in the 80s, Lama Zopa became the head. So yeah, he's one of my teachers and I've taken empowerments, teachings, and mm. very, very wise um, being very powerful and effective um, and also kind of out of this world, like a person who clearly has a level of realization that you just feel like you're with someone who's from another planet uh -huh. when you spend time with him. Mm. But oh, luckily he can translate it into English for us. Yeah, because he spoke English. I mean, I, I think oh, yes, I, very well. I wanted to get with him. I've done podcasts with several lamas and he was on my list, but unfortunately he passed by the time that all... Yeah, could come together. And here you are. You're taking his place, Scott. Uh, well, that, that's <laughs> amusing. Um, there are some good. There, Kandra, there's a woman named Kandra La who is probably yeah, you know I the know one the one who's you know taking his place spiritually in the or a very same thing a very very highly realized woman mm -hmm. like a, a person. It's hard to even say what level of realization she has. You know, bodhisattva. Mm. A person who has very high realization and ability to teach and embody the teaching. So, mm. oh, that's so great. Um, yeah. Just picking up on a couple of the themes in the book as I went through it. Well, first of all, I, and uh, so that uh, Lama kind of propelled you into this book, who suggested, why don't you just take out, you know, the esoteric stuff blah, yeah blah. well you know there was it was a few different things because i invite i got invited to start teaching meditation 18 years ago and i asked my teachers like really is this a good idea and they said yeah it's good for people to learn from someone who's more a peer than a teacher which is like okay that's that's a good reason to teach that. <laughs> i still kind of i still like to call myself a teaching assistant <laughs> rather mm. than a teacher because i know mm. you know teachers with real realizations mm. um but it first started by when I was teaching and I was trying to teach authentically this, the path that the book is based on, How to Train Your Happy Mind, comes from what's called the Lam Rim, which yeah. is the stages of the path. It's a kind of condensed, very effective ordering of the Buddhist teachings. But if you teach it authentically, the very first topic talks about karma, rebirth, and other realms. And so I just have, a, you know, some people have a kind of sensitivity when you're speaking to an audience. You can kind of get the vibe of how they're reacting. Uh -huh. You know, it's like, oh, this is just not right. Like some of these people, it's going to be the first time in and first time out and <laughs> last time in a meditation yeah, right. session. Yeah. So first it was just by seeing people's reaction and we were advertising classes open to everybody. You don't have to be a Buddhist, but then we weren't really delivering on that. Then His Holiness wrote a book called Beyond Religion. Uh, so in addition to what Lama Yeshe's, you know, quotes, his Holiness wrote a whole book about it. Ethics for a New Millennium is also similar. But in Beyond Religion, he actually says, the time has come for a system of ethics and that goes beyond religion. And so he that's like a manifesto to people yeah. like me. He didn't say exactly how to do it, but he encouraged people like me, you know, however you know far along we were on the path, to do our best to try to put the teachings into a form that was um, secular, accessible, modern, and as authentic as possible, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. So, so that's what I, that's that's what I tried to do. And then you know, I talked to my teachers; they were very in, encouraging. And you know, eventually, like the most amazing thing about this book is that it has a forward by His Holiness the Dalai yeah, Lama. So I saw that. the I saw. the last uh, audience for the book before it was published was the Dalai Lama in his office, who read the whole thing 
and said, okay, it's beneficial. We, we, His Holiness will write a forward. And we have a few corrections for you, <laughs> <They said. laughs> which was great because I'd already had about 25 different people of all different backgrounds comb through it. And that I felt like it it revised the la- some of the last little bits to make sure they were as authentic right. as possible to the Tibetan Buddhist tradition um, while being accessible to a non-Buddhist who doesn't believe, who's secular, who doesn't believe in anything yeah. beyond what science and psychology tell us about reality today. Yeah. Uh, and that's, it's so in line with what I try to do with this particular podcast and, and others on the Be Here Now Network, mm-hmm. you know, many of them. And uh, yeah, accessibility is a great word to allow people not to, you don't have to join anything. You don't have to get confronted, you know, right off the bat by very lofty prescriptions, shall we say. There's a way you can just, wait a minute, just stop. And be here now, actually. That's a good starting point. And, uh, yeah, so talk about, uh, in particular, um, and, you know, the book starts around this premise of analytical meditation, so that might sound a little bit like uh, daunting, just the word analytical. Yeah. I mean, honestly, it, it did that to me. Because Wait a minute, analytical? You're going to be only in the head? There's no heart? What do you mean? What's going on? You know, that kind of a reactivity. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so talk about it, though, and, and it's uh, yeah, sure. fullness. Um, well, I didn't feel comfortable renaming analytical meditation. I think it's, it, is, it is quite well named because most people today still would think there's just one type of meditation. And that is a meditation where you focus on one thing, usually your breath, and you try to calm your mind, relax your mind, and also become less reactive. We call it mindfulness. So it's, um, and it does, it does that. But from a Tibetan Buddhist perspective, there's a second type of meditation called analytical meditation that's almost like the rest of the Library of Congress or something, you know. It's like filling your mind with thoughts, ideas, feelings, emotions, um, being critical, analyzing, being very emotional, having big visions and uh, visualizations. Um, it's like the whole, uh, it's like all of media, you know, but beneficial. One, a good definition of, you know, analytical meditation uh, from the Buddhist perspective are um uh, thoughts that bring out your best qualities. So yeah. analytical meditation topics range from how precious every day is. You know, that's the first one actually, is you wake up and you think, oh, I'm still alive. <laughs> like, I, I think we can all think to everybody listening, you know, th- what are your first typical first thought in the morning? Like, oh no, I don't want to get up. Oh God, what about work? I'll reach for my phone, right? You can train yourself through analytical meditation you know, I mean, if you really wanted to, you could name it something like fun meditation. I don't know. But um, through analytical meditation, you can train yourself when you wake up, oh, I'm still alive. Like, that's great. Like, yeah, everyone has problems. I have them too. But I'm still alive. What can I do with one more day alive? Mm-hmm. You know, what's what's possible? Mm-hmm. What's possible? And, uh, and, and what's my responsibility too? Like, what do I know about how special it is to be human? You know, like, you know, cows and cats and things, they generally can't, don't, can't decide to do, make big changes in their life. <laughs> you know, they're just kind of eating and relaxing if they're not stressed out. But we have this extraordinary ability to understand and to be compassionate. Like, we can get pretty down on humans, but we're almost, I think we're close to the only species that just cares for everybody, you know, like in other species, if you're disabled or you have, like, like you get you killed, get you know, just get pushed out the pushed out of the nest. So um, it's actually yeah. quite, the Dalai Lama said civilization is kindness. And yeah. I actually invite everybody to think about that because there's an awful lot of terrible things to think about right now um, yeah. going yeah. on. And we can talk about, you know, ways of dealing with those psychologically and being a, a cause for them to end. But if you just look at the day-to-day of every person on earth, in general, we're all caring for each other. We're all taking care of each other. We're making meals for each other. We're making money to pay the bills and repair the roads and 
run podcasts and um, mm-hmm. take care of you know take care of sick people. So many people in the healthcare industry. Like when you really look at it, like just by and also when we walk down the street, people don't punch you in the face. <laughs> you know, like people actually people are polite. It's like a polite civilization. So it does get quite. You see the worst in the media, and those things definitely happen. But if you look at the vast mass of human activity, it's people taking care of each other. Yeah. People yeah, taking care of each other. That's a great point. Uh, and the point about, you know, having a body, a human yeah. incarnation. I was fortunate it, back at that time when I first went Period. to India to meet um, Kalu Rinpoche. Great. Mm-hmm. Uh, like probably a Geshe, I would, I would say. I don't remember if they gave him that name or He's not. He's an extraordinary teacher, yeah. yeah. I, I, I know his books and, and his yeah, lineage, yeah. yeah. So um, I ended up where uh, I, I'm from Canada, and uh, I was at a luncheon with him, if you can imagine that, at the Canadian High Commissioner's mm. house in Delhi because I was getting him to help me out with a passport thing. And uh, these CBC guys, Canadian broadcasting guys, said, come with us because we're going to interview Carlo Rinpoche. And I said, sure, that sounds great. This is combined, by the way, with uh, my uh, Neem Karoli Baba. The day before when I came down to Delhi, I went to see him. And he said, did you just have darshan of a Tibetan Lama? And I said, I never even met a Tibetan, never mind a Lama. He said, oh, okay. <laughs> Jiao, go. And then suddenly there he was. I was having lunch with him. So mm, I was wow. a little bit out there to say the very least. But I went with them and he was bored with their questions about Christianity. What do I know about Christianity? You know, it was that kind of thing. And then they said, well, maybe you should ask him something. And boom, he sat up and just, you know, it was like a laser. One of the things that he said, and I, you know, I, it was about a half hour. It was a, quite a while of him I asking questions and him responding. And one of them was, take care of your body. Mm. You can only become free with a human body, no other way, have respect, and and so on. And I'll never forget that. It, I was so, so powerful, of course, coming from a being like this. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so waking up in the morning saying, wow, mm-hmm. we made and, it through. <laughs> we have yeah, another yeah, one day. more night. Uh, the, and you know, there's also, the other side of it is, you know, like the scientific side, because I I watched the Cosmos, you know, the Carl Sagan Cosmos series yeah, yeah. when I was like ten yeah. years old. That came out, yeah. and something Carl Sagan said was, "We are a way for the universe to know itself," mm. and that really yeah, sat with me for my whole life. Like, mm. wow, and that's that from early age. That's what gave me a sense of responsibility in life. Is wow, we are like we're as far as we can tell, we're the only creatures here that can figure out what's going on in the universe, both psychologically and materially, you know, like to know what the stars are and that there are galaxies and other other planets and DNA and cells and, um, mm. you know, all of medicine that we've... So it's it's really extraordinary and you think, wow, what's, what's my responsibility as a, a, a self-aware human being with agency and, and so much wealth we have, even people who aren't like wealthy the way you think you're wealthy. We're extraordinarily wealthy compared to how, you know, human beings have were until recently. So um what do you do with all that? What do you do with that? Uh, what do you do with that life? So so that combination of kind of like practical, oh my goodness, I'm still alive. What am I going to do with today? And wow, what is a human being's responsibility in the universe? Like we're really special and and we tend to forget about it and get lost in very, very silly and destructive activities. Yeah. That's a wild understatement. Um, but back to analytical meditation. So you, uh, in the book you talk about, you know, meditation's deeper purpose is to strengthen the positive qualities, right? That we all possess, openness, compassion, kindness, generosity, patience, gratitude, and joy. The type of meditation that actively steers your mind towards these qualities, that is called analytic analytical right. yeah. meditation. And then I just go down a little further in stabilizing meditation, also popularly known as mindfulness, which I don't think there's any podcast that I do that we don't have some reference to mindfulness because people are asking, okay, well, I 
I get it to the point, to the extent that I, I get it in terms of, you know, being able to transform ourselves and what are the, what's the methodology? And for sure, the first thing is, is of course, meditation and mindfulness. And um, where you're totally honest and present with yourself, accepting whatever occurs in your body and mind without needing to act on it. Stabilizing meditation helps calm your mind and makes you less reactive. Scott, I tell you over the years, anybody asks me, okay, what, what the hell have you gotten out of all this? You've been doing it for decades. It's exactly that. Makes you less reactive. Start there. But I have this great thing I want to, I want to read to you and everybody else. It's from Ramana Maharshi. Ramana Maharshi? You, you know of him. That, like Maharishi or Ma- Ram, Ram, no, not Maharishi. Okay, Ramana different. Maharshi. Oh, he maybe he I was in that. South India, Tirvanamalam, in this town, and um, m- many Westerners. I'm talking late forties, fifty, early fifties. He he died somewhere in the mid fifties, I think. Um, were with him, and one man in particular, his name was Robert Adams, and he was with Ramana Maharshi, who said to him. The only spiritual life you need is not to react. I just saw this, you know, the other day on social and picked it up. To be, and this is Robert, to be calm is the greatest asset in the world. When you are perfectly calm, time stops. There is no time. Karma stops. Samskaras stop. Everything becomes null and void. I love that quote. And it, and it fits with, uh, what, what you're talking about in relation to mindfulness and meditation and, and the stability that comes from it and, and what analytical meditation is. It's, it's really good. Mm. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Um, I, I was, let's see. There's a couple of other things that struck me as themes that I wanted to share. Um, Okay, you just talked about it. What's the first thing you do when you wake up in the morning? And it's a good idea. I mean, and 99.9 are doing what you said. Picking up their phone and, okay, checking in one way or the other, right? Yeah, well, yeah, the first thing is kind of like, oh, God, I don't want to wake up. Yeah, well, God, I don't <laughs> then, get this, Then it's right. like, okay... How can I distract myself? You know, and yeah. and it's just you. Le- and I'm. And by the way, it's nobody's fault. Like this is just conditioning. It's whatever you spend time with, you become like the phone is extremely addictive. Um, <laughs> but um, you know, there there is an alternative. Like it's if there's one thing you can do to improve your life, it's do not reach for your phone first thing in the morning. Do do something to connect with yourself. Um, if you meditate, that's uh, fantastic. Do some meditation. Some people it's running exercise, but do it without music, without a podcast, like just to be <laughs> yeah. present. Oh, no, the, come on. For the you run. Play a, you uh, can play one podcast. You play this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least for the first, you know, for, at least for 15 minutes, do something that yeah, you only right. connect with yourself. You know, some people it's yoga. Um, uh. Some people it's writing. Like some people do automatic writing. Like they'll wake up and they'll just write, and it's extraordinary. A, lot, a number of writers I know, like all of their best writing comes from that place. They don't even like they go back and they don't even remember having written like, yeah, it's just extraordinary yeah. sentences and paragraphs. Yeah, but you... yeah, like what you what you rob yourself of when you lurch for the phone, especially first thing, is it it conditions your whole day to be externally defined by entertainment, reputation. Um, uh, yeah. I, you know, as a reward and punishment, <laughs> what else, whatever. Um, if you can just get a basis for the day in trying to connect with just what it's like to be alive, it, it breaks my heart. I've seen people, I've had seen writers write about this, especially people who are professional writers, how every single moment of their day is there's filled with stimulation there. If they have any moment, uh, I mean, they're interacting with people, whatever. If they have any free moment, then they're reading the newspaper, they're listening to podcasts. Sorry, I run a podcast too. There's, <laughs> are, there's nice. There's all kinds of good ways to interact with media. It's just that you need some time to connect with yourself. Yeah. Um, and if you're in a relationship, especially, it's the same thing. So many relationships are doing so poorly because of a lack of me time. 
and the people just aren't taking care of themselves. So if you're into meditation, meditation is a particularly powerful way to do it because, and it's the chapter even before I begin the sequence is I talk about the mind. Because if you write, if this book is supposed to tell you how to have a happy mind, the first part of it has to tell you what a mind is. And, um, <laughs> yeah, right. and, and then in that chapter, I share some very esoteric meditations actually that are rarely taught to people, which are traditionally called Mahamudra which is mm-hmm. like the nature oh, yeah. of the mind. Yeah, yeah. And that's the way not only to get me time, but to go to peel away the layers of okay, at first there's me, my personality, um, my job, my my reputation and so on, my where I sit in the matrix of humanity. Beneath that, there's like a subtle a subtle mind, which is kind of what you touch in meditation, you know, like a still calm calmness is like the the subtle mind. Then there's an extremely subtle mind. Tibetan Buddhism is very good at putting things into these categories. So there's like three the levels best. of mind. The the, there's the extremely subtle mind. And that, there's a lot of ways of talking about that, but there's ways even beginners can touch it. And I, I distilled some of those nature of mind meditations down to their essence so that you can try to see what am I beneath thoughts, feelings, personality, even beneath calm, like something fundamental and and you discover like wow it might you may not get it the first time it might take even a couple of years but eventually you discover whoa there's like a fundamental goodness you know, they call it buddha nature in buddhism which i think is a very bad term for it the buddha didn't call his religion buddhism that would have been quite uh, <laughs> egotistic he just really called it reality and buddha nature he didn't call it buddha nature it was just fundamental goodness clarity uh-huh. Um, and everybody has that. And if you learn how to touch it, then that's like a refuge you can touch um, at any moment or, or at least at the beginning or end of the day to kind of reconnect like, whoa, there's something much, much deeper to me and to reality. And then to have that stable base as you go go through your life. So it's yeah. a little bit mystical, but, it's, but there's nothing about it that um, is supernatural. It's yeah. just that there's a subtler levels of the mind you can touch. Um, get to know yourself better. A good Become your friend. own best friend is yeah, a good way of putting it. That's you. a good one. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Um I I have a good friend, I'm sure you know, Sharon Salzberg. You know, oh Sharon yeah. Is. She's an incredible teacher, yeah. Yeah. So we were teaching together at uh in Maui when Ramdas is still alive. Actually we still do it. Um and my good friend and podcaster, Duncan Trussell, uh, w- was there, and we were talking about the path and pretty much what you and I are talking about right now. But then all of a sudden he said, you know, Sharon, what do you do when you first get up in the morning? <laughs> what, 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 is your, what is your practice or what is your first want to do, shall we say? And she said, I get up, I sit down on my cushion, and I get real. And that was it. What that did was set off a whole series of books she's written, Real Love, yeah. <laughs> and so on and so forth. And I love that. because I love that term. It is just so grounding, right? Because it describes to me what you were just speaking to, which yeah. is getting underneath the personality, the thoughts, the psychology, Mm -hmm. even the calmness. Yep. Yeah. And you know, in our tradition, you know, in Mahayana Buddhism, like often the first thought is actually, like the way, you know, I will wake up, most people in my tradition wake up, is we think, may everyone be happy, (laughs) actually. Like that's generally like the first thought in Mahayana Buddhism is, boy, would it be nice if everyone was happy. And then... I'm going to be a cause for that happiness. Ah, yeah. However, to whatever right. my ability, um, that's like the, you know, the slightly, to take it one step further. Once you, once you got, got to know yourself a little bit, you know, you feel comfortable with yourself, then think, oh boy, it's really my, it's, and it's not too hard. You know, it doesn't mean, you know, you don't have to run for president or something like that. Um, you, just smile at people. The Dalai Lama, actually, I have a great quote in the book, actually, I found with the Dalai Lama. He said, you know, sometimes I think smiling is more powerful than meditating. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. 
So like yeah. there's very small things that we can each do. Um, like when I get on a call with a, say, when I go into a store or when I'm on the phone with a customer service person, <laughs> always first thing, how are you doing? But but how are you doing doesn't actually mean that in our in our in our society it usually just means like hello, and yeah. it, but it depends on your your face and your eyes when you or your and your voice when you say that. If you say how are you doing, and then there's a sense of paying attention, you know, if you're with someone, you look at them like you really care and you want to hear an answer. Yeah. It's amazing what someone will tell you. You know, they're like they're like, ooh, someone really wants to yeah. know. Totally turn around. So yeah. many times during my days, every day. Someone says, "Oh, you're the first person to ask me that today. Thank you for asking. Thank you for." And they smile, and it it's amazing. You can make a big difference in someone's day just by sincerely asking how they're doing and feeling the space to to listen, whatever that answer and, is, for as, yeah, long, as long as they want. Even if there's a line of people behind, yeah, you. Right, right. You know, it's, yeah. it's 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 connecting with people isn't so hard, yeah. but we're taught efficiency, which is almost like this awful, cruel, like, dagger of civilization, efficiency. Um, yeah. It makes sense in, in certain, you know, manufacturing or something, but not in human relationships. You want human relationships to be as inefficient as possible. Yeah. <laughs> you want a doctor that's yeah. going to spend an hour with you. You want a friend who'll spend, you know, three three hours with you listening. Yeah. So, yeah. kindness. We, we would call that yeah. kindness. Yeah. Buddhist ethics can be distilled into nonviolence, kindness, and understanding your mind. Which is a beautiful trio, you know. It's a very beautiful trio. So that middle—that's the middle one, kindness. Yeah, you know, one of my favorite quotes is from Simone Weil, the great writer. Oh yeah, yeah. And she said, "The most generous act that you can do for another human being is pay attention." Oh, that's wonderful because I love that quote. I, I've heard it as you know, the greatest gift you can give someone is your attention. But I didn't. Yeah. I don't think I knew the source, so that's fantastic, Simone yeah. Weil. It's so true. Yeah. It's so true. It's all any of us want, especially if you're in a relationship. You know that. Oh, well, right. Because yeah. that's you're a like, whole oh. other thing, but not even that. Yeah, you're with friends, but anybody, and you, anybody. You, you know, and you're they're starting to tell you something, and you feel like, should I have to get somewhere, or uh, this is boring, and you do, you look away, mm-hmm. and you do that, and as soon as you do that, that person is crushed, basically. Because you've yeah. you've thrown them out of your heart in a way. Yeah, they not. call it a bid for connection, you know, a bid yeah. for connection. But to do it for strangers, you know, I mean, if we definitely want to do it for the people you're close to in your life. But then Start it's there. actually kind of easy with strangers because you know it's only going to last a few seconds, and it makes such a big, such a yeah. big impact. When you do something for someone, you know, they know you didn't have to do it. And it's not transactional. You just did yeah. it yeah, yeah. to be nice exactly. and to be kind. And mm. to can make a little bit of connection in the world. You know, uh, there's something else that struck me. Uh, where you talk about, uh, this is about meditation. And yeah. people striving to do meditation in order to get chilled out. Yeah. Or calm down. Whatever. There's lots of different motives for meditation that aren't, I think it's all great because something can happen in the middle of that kind of intention, right? And uh, and you, it, one of the things, one of those kinds of things, was the appreciation of the beauty of a safe, privileged life. Mm-hmm. I just went through something. Uh, actually, we're we're putting on a retreat uh, next month. By the way, everybody, a little bit of a spot here. There's still a few spots open for our Ramdas Legacy Retreat in the Summer Mountains of Boone, North Carolina. Um, and we so we got the faculty together, and we were, you know, talking about what it is, how we were going to present what we were wanting to present, which was basically around finding harmony in in the sacred, and uh, parsing that out, workshopping it out, and yeah. so on. And you know, of course, we're in a moment right now that is extraordinarily disharmonious. Okay in our society and it's just it's it's you know it's just blowing up pretty much as as what happened the other day and there was a feeling amongst people that it's fine to give people a way to practice 
And, but it's not fine to use that as a way of appreciating, you know, the nice warm spot that you're in and not attending to social injustice, et cetera. And we can go on environmental degradation. We can go on and on and on, of course. Yeah, talk about that for a minute. So I write about that in the book very clearly in the beginning. And there's a very, very useful new term called spiritual bypass. And that's what that describes, is when people will mm-hmm. use spirituality kind of like a spa treatment. so uh, Or like watching TV or whatever. It, it's a way of just checking out, relaxing. Um, and there's not necessarily anything, I'm not saying there's anything horribly wrong about this, just that it's not a path that actually develops you. It's just a way of kind of pausing, checking out, like go to the spa or go to the movies, watch TV. It's, just, it's, it's the equivalent of that. When you use meditation as a way to escape because meditation is meant to be a way to truly connect with yourself and and all of reality and so that's why one of the first things i say in introducing meditation almost every week when i lead meditation at the gyoto foundation nearby i'll say meditation isn't relaxing and people say what really say no i say compare meditation to other relaxing activities um uh going for a walk watching TV, um, having a glass of wine, (laughs) smoking a joint, (laughs) whatever, all up to having a bubble bath, going to spa, massage. If you're honest, you compare meditation to those things, meditation will come last on the list in compared to how relaxing those other ones are for most people. So that's why you really, you need to look at the true purpose of meditation, which is to bring out your best qualities. Like none of those other activities is going to bring out your best qualities in an enduring, you know, sustained way. But meditation will. And that's the point is to really like come to grips with reality. And there's beautiful aspects of it, there's troubling aspects of it. But meditation, analytical meditation, you know, truly allows you to um, face reality with like joy, strength, um, self-respect, other respect, you know, genuine love right. and compassion right. for everybody. It's a, and we have examples of people like this, like Martin Luther King Jr., Gandhi, yeah. Solinus the Dalai Lama, and you probably have friends too. Like I think we all have this kind of selfless friend, many selfless friends. It's just it's unbelievable sometimes. Like people, often caretakers, people who are like nurses, teachers, right. they just seem to live their life. Parents, moms, who just live their life for others. Um, and that's where happiness comes from, from the, you know, this deep Buddhist perspective. Yeah. I like to um, share with people that start, as far as meditation is concerned, start with the idea that you might make friends with yourself. Yeah. Start there, you know. To okay. me is the most basic a reason to sit down for however, whatever length of time. So, yeah, go ahead. You're no, say. you're absolutely right. Most of the people I know who've gone on very long retreats, that was what they said was the first thing they had to conquer was becoming their own best friend. Yeah. And that's yeah. what you really get, I think, from deep, deep meditation practice is you're happy when you're alone, absolutely happy. You're happy when nothing's happening, just sitting yeah. there looking at wherever you are. It's like it just feels good to be in your body, in your mind, alive. Yeah. And then you're happy with other people in a non um, needy way. You know, we all know people like this. They walk into a room and everyone just loves them. You know, there's certain types of people they walk into a room, everyone mm-hmm. loves them. Yeah. And we all have the capacity to be that way. It's actually, it's actually a real contentment with yourself. It's, yeah. it's, 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 comf- it's, it's, it's an interesting combination because on the one hand, you're totally content with yourself and, on the, and it gives you so much to offer others at the same time, you know, to be, give people your attention. And then, you know, sometimes your wisdom, if they ask for it, <laughs> you don't want to, you don't want to kind of give it unsolicited. But yeah. You become the kind of person too. people come in when they have a hard time, um, you know, like yeah. not just small talk and fun, but when things are difficult, they come to you and say, Hey, can you How listen? How about, um, I think we've, we've touched on this a little bit, but I love this. Am I more important than everyone else in the universe? And and Bob Thurman, who you quoted here, who we love him a, a lot. He he joins us in, in various activities. Um, 
he ends up saying, each of us believes that we are just a little bit more important than everyone else. And uh, I, uh, uh, with Duncan Trussell, I did an audio book that we put out earlier this year called The Movie of Me to the Movie of We. And it was coined by Krishna Das. I don't know if you know who he is, a chant master. Mm -hmm. And um, he used to say, you wake up in the morning and it's the movie of me. You're the protagonist, the producer, the director, the writer. In fact, you even write your own reviews. 24-7 is this obsession, mm -hmm. you know. And so we decided, mm -hmm. let's use ourselves as examples mm -hmm. of this obsession and maybe show a path to transform to, you know, what His Holiness talks about the platform of, uh, or the perspective of yeah. altruistic wisdom, basically. And uh, yeah. to me, this is one of the most important things for people uh, to, um, to realize that that is part of why we were put here on this planet, is to provide something outside of ourselves. You know, Ram Dass did a lot of work over the years in this uh, respect. He did a lot of service stuff and he did a lot of work. I mean, his thing, which you know I love, you can be on more than two planes of consciousness at the same time. You can be on the plane where you're working on yourself and changing your innards in order to be able to successfully do the kind of social action that you see fit to do. You can do that. They can happen simultaneously. And I think that's really, you know, super, super important. And uh, so I love this this stage five. <laughs> yeah, so, and I'll tell you, that that's trying to be a bit skillful because for your average person, um, if they've heard anything at all about Buddhism, what they've heard is life is suffering. It's yeah, like, right, right. It's, the, it's like yeah, the first, enough it, of that, it, it actually <laughs> was the Buddha's first teaching, although I, I'm not sure, I don't think that's the greatest translation of it. But um, I did not name that chapter suffering, even though that is the yeah, tradition, that, that's the yeah, kind of typical way they do it, it well. in Western books. Yeah. I tried to give the, the stages like what I would call tasty titles, you know, things that make you want yeah, to learn yeah. more. So yeah. yeah, am I the most important person in the, in the universe? It's a little cheeky. Yeah. Um, and you know, it's just, there are Buddhist meditations. The first time I heard it was Robert Thurman, right near here, who's speaking in Berkeley right after I became a Buddhist. Oh, yeah. And I don't know, it rang true to me. He said, you know, look at yourself and ask yourself honestly, do you think you're just a little bit important than all these people in this auditorium? You know, we're in an auditorium with a few hundred people, all the people in this town, all the people on earth, um, or less important. That's what I like to add, because it goes both ways. It's yeah. whether it's, it's more important it's, it's or some people say, absolutely not, coin. I don't. I think I'm yeah. worse than everybody. Yeah. Same thing. It's the yeah. same thing. It's just yeah. not equal. And the antidote is at first equanimity, just like, because if you ask, ask most people listening to this podcast or in America, do you believe in human rights? Of course. Everyone would say, I believe in every, universal human rights. But then do you embody that in your mind and in your behavior? Dang. Do you really think everyone is equal to everyone equally deserves um, happiness, wealth, and so on. And, you know, the answer is answers often no. The, the very powerful visualization you could do in um, uh, a, a meditation called Exchanging Self with Others uh, in, in Tibetan Buddhism, yeah. where you sit and you imagine yourself first with the people very close to you, you know, and then um, strangers, enemies, and then everyone on earth, 8 billion people. And you think, do I want to live my life just using them all, like using them all for me, for my happiness. Um, is that the life I want to live where the people manufacturing my food, manufacturing my clothes, um, you know, giving me a job and all this, handing me my coffee. Like the thing, does happiness really come from that? No, even just thinking about it, it hurts. You're like, oh, using everybody, just like using everybody. Um, um, or me here in the middle of 8 billion people, do I want to be a cause of their happiness? Like, is that the orientation? I'm not, and it doesn't have to be superhero, you know, Martin Luther King Jr. It can be Dalai Lama, just in every, just smiling, whoever, you, you know, having a little conversation, whoever you encounter, trying to 
do something meaningful with your work, taking care of your family, friends, and being kind, nonviolent. That's all it takes. That's all it takes. And you just, I mean, thinking through, as you hear this right now, like, which one do you choose? Like, And go ahead and choose the nihilistic, selfish option for a week or two and see mm-hmm. how a lot of people do it, especially like in college, you know, when people are like totally hedonistic or their 20s. Yeah, did that, was that time really fun? When you look back, was it actually, was it actually enjoyable? Like being, being selfish, try, being selfish just for a day. You know, if you want to experiment, you, you don't know, think this is true. Experiment you for don't a day, have to we, try, yeah. uh, everybody. Yeah. Yeah. We're yeah. all doing it every yeah. moment. In just, general, we've already done that experiment. Yeah. But if you haven't, try one day, be selfish. The next day, be totally generous and take every homeless person you see, at least smile at them or, you know, buy them a, buy them a yeah. lunch. See how you feel at the end of that day. You feel great. Listen to people. Listen. Li- when conversations listen without thinking of the next thing you're going to say. You know, just, just sit there listening. Right. Like, oh, tell me more about that. Yeah. Um, yeah. You feel so great about yourself and you can sleep really well. At that um, It's not, you really want to feel great about yourself. You know, you want to feel like, huh, oh, I, I did nice things today for people. Right. That's enough. That's the, be- uh, by the, the just the beauty of, of mindfulness practice. It really, and you get in, you, of course, it has to evolve. It has to evolve. And that's a, statement but it will evolve i believe if you are sincere in the practice it will evolve to a point where you're not judging what you see you see all of these selfish motivations moment to moment how do we you know how am i going to get the best of this situation how am i going to uh you know win over somebody in order for the uh the results to be what i want I mean, there's so many subtle versions. I mean, it gets very subtle, you know, very subtle, including spiritual teachers and so on. Yeah. And mindfulness, if you can get it to it. That's why I love uh, Ram Dass uh, had a great thing called loving awareness. So moving out of your story and your thinking mind into the center of your being. Yeah. And taking a few breaths. And from that vantage point... Mm -hmm the spaciousness of loving awareness occurs and you are no longer ripping yourself to shreds for what you see as selfish, selfish motivations and so on. And uh, it's very powerful if, yeah. if you, you know, but it takes practice, which yeah. is what you're and suggesting is, in this yeah. book. And it is good to, to first notice it, like you say, with mindfulness. The thing about mindfulness, it doesn't, on its own, it doesn't give you ways to steer out of it like that's why you uh-huh. also need the analytical meditation and, and it, like in buddhism mindfulness is like one one thousandth of the path it's it's important but it's actually yeah. it, like it lacks an ethical dimension i talk about that in the book like pure uh-huh. mindfulness at least from the buddhist definition of it lacks an ethical dimension and i talk about this in the book like the u.s military uses mindfulness in two ways one yeah, is to overcome right. ptsd wonderful the others, they train snipers to, right. so that their hands don't shake. They're like, breathe in, breathe yeah. out, pay attention yeah. to your feelings. Yeah. Don't yeah. let them just distract you from yeah. killing that person. Yeah. So I think it's quite important to point out like mindfulness just on its own is not a complete yeah. path. Yeah. And people can use mindfulness yeah. actually for evil, like to become more focused in doing um, harmful acts yeah. in the world. So you need an ethical dimension. Yeah. Um, on top of mindfulness. And that's yeah. where like analytical, that's why His Holiness is always saying analytical meditation. If you see him speak in person in the last few years, he's always saying we need people to you know, develop an ethical foundation and practice analytical meditation to under- first understand and then steer your thoughts, steer your thoughts to beneficial ways of thinking and acting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that is a very good point. <laughs> 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 and you know it's not just my point many many people have no no said but this. it's uh, it's very true um yeah i think it's a strong combination and yeah. uh yeah i love the book scott it really gives people especially people who are you know kind of wondering about well as soon as you say buddhist they get scared never mind anything else yeah. uh and uh yeah this is a nice entry point for people to understand and uh, and I love what His Holiness has been saying for years around secular ethics, 
And uh, uh, I think that uh, you don't have to be a Buddhist to take some advantage of some of the things that are in this book. So I thank you for it. Oh, sure, yeah. You know, I have a great quote in the beginning from one of my teachers, Geshe Namdak, who says, Buddhism is not meant to make more Buddhists. Mm. It is meant <laughs> yeah. to make happy minds. Mm. That's Perfect. the purpose. So yeah. So thank you. I really appreciate the invitation to talk yeah, to you. It's, I appreciate everything you do. You know, we just need hundreds of thousands of more people like flooding the airwaves. So it's yeah. just, so you can find, you know, 24 yeah. seven intentional conversations yeah. and wisdom about how to steer our minds and our activities towards yeah. benefiting ourselves. First of all, just being happy with the quite abundant lives most of us have. And then doing good in the world, how to engage in um, an effective way. You yeah. know, the, the world's, you know, go, going a bit off course <laughs> here and there. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and and we can, we we can make a difference. Each of us can make a really huge difference. Yeah, um, absolutely. But it's got to start within oneself for sure. Yeah, um, and that's and that's surprising. I, you know, a lot of people who are activists are surprised to hear that. Like you can't. I know. It like becomes, His Holiness. I've heard people ask His Holiness, "How do you end war?" And he says, "Make up." Resolve all the conflicts in your own life. Mm. Do perfect. that first. Perfect. Do that first. Yeah. If you do that, then you'll be a powerful mm -hmm. activist. Yeah. It's like people are, you know, so we are so polarized, right? Yeah. And that's actually what this uh, I had in mind with other people who devised, you know, what are we going to talk about at this retreat in, in August? And it was start with the polarization inside yourself, inside ourselves. That's what's got to be straightened out before you can even think of yes. adding to the conversation in terms of uh, our social and political lives, you know? Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for being here. Everybody uh, will have a link to Scott's book, of course, and to Scott. And uh, I suppose you can always sit with him, too, and... Uh, in the Bay Area, if you're in the Bay Area, yeah, yeah, and I have, you know, I run a podcast called A Skeptic's Path to oh, Enlightenment, yeah. and we ha now live. have an online community called Train a Happy Mind. So I'm meeting oh, yeah. uh, Sunday mornings now with oh, people, cool. um, and I'm leading a retreat also August wow. 8th to 11th on all the topics from the How to Train oh, a Happy really? Mind oh. book at at the Vajrapani Institute in so, California. This will be on your website, so we'll put yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. We'll get it's to, the, yeah. You, actually, you'll send me something so we can get the. Sure. Show notes, people, to put it up on beherenownetwork.com slash mindrolling. And uh, you'll get all the information you need. Mm -hmm. And you can look for Duncan and Mai's audio book, mm -hmm. The Movie of Me to the Movie of We. <laughs> uh, that's available on Audible and Apple and all that. And uh, yeah, we hope to see you again, Scott. Oh, thank this you. I really enjoyed the conversation. Everybody will see you next week. <laughs>